Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm told we're good to go. So uh, a very warm welcome to you to our uh, September meeting. As usual, I will get the parish notices out of the way uh, and then we'll move on to, uh, to Roger's talk, which is what you've really come for, I'm sure. Um, if there is any sort of fire alarm uh, that is not pre-planned, it will be for real. Uh, I doubt whether it will happen, but you never know. If it does, you uh, emerge either by uh, going out the way you came in or through the uh, back door exit uh, here, uh, which takes you right into the passageway uh, alongside Wellington Street. Uh, now, what do I need to tell you? Um, we are moving office. In fact, we have moved office along with uh, a number of the museum's uh, management uh, functions. Uh, the Friends Office is now at Albany House, uh, which of those of you who have a London Transport connection will know is actually part of the 55 Broadway complex. Uh, we have been packed up in crates for the last fortnight, awaiting for the removal men to come and for our IT equipment to be ready. Uh, we moved in this morning, and I have to say, I'm not certain whether this desk is wood, but I will assume it is, and touch wood, as I say it, um, that we found this morning that things were uh, in a far better state of readiness uh, than at one time we feared we might be. The phones are working, uh, the IT systems are working, uh, as yet the printers are not working, uh, but it's looking fairly good. But that does mean to say that there has been quite a hiatus uh, in our ability to do the secretarial and the membership functions uh, over the last fortnight and certainly in the next week or two as we unpack all the crates and get it all sorted. So if you are corresponding with Susan, uh, if you are uh, sending off a membership renewal, if we're not quite as prompt uh, as you would wish us to be and we would wish to be uh, in the next fortnight or so, um, bear with us, we will get it all straight. Um, for the time being, Mail can continue to be addressed here and will be forwarded to Albany House. Uh, and the phones also transfer. Um, to my great pleasure, literally, as I arrived this morning in our new office, the phone rang and I picked it up and I said, Friends Office, and there was someone wanting to talk to the Friends Office, so it was good. Um, so none of that changes at the moment, um, but there may come a time when we give you a different phone number, uh, and almost certainly there will come a time when we give you a, a, an address to have the mail sent straight to, to Albany House. So that's the admin. Um, three forthcoming events to draw your attention to. Uh, as you should know, if you're plugged into the Friends email system, which most of you are, um, there is an event this coming Saturday on the piazza uh, linked to the fact that the museum is swapping the B-type buses here, which are on display. Uh, old Bill, which has been here for the last four years, is going back to the Imperial War Museum, uh, and the museum's battle bus is coming here, so f two of the B-types uh, are moving around Covent Garden, uh, and uh, there has been the splendid idea that, given that that was happening, uh, it is an opportunity, possibly never to be repeated, uh, to bring onto the piazza, as well as those two B-types, the other two surviving double-deck B-types, uh, the museum's other vehicle, B340, uh, and Barry Weathered's uh, recently, relatively recently, restored B-type. So, God willing, uh, all of those four... Uh, will be on the piazza. They should be in place by nine o'clock because that's a requirement of getting access with vehicles to the piazza. Uh, and will be there at least until the early afternoon. There is the possibility, but it is only that, of there being a road run for some of those vehicles, not all of them are actually runners, um, to the cenotaph uh, in the afternoon, uh, probably at about three o'clock, but that isn't yet confirmed. Uh, and if that run does take place, those buses that go on that trip will not return to Covent Garden. They'll be taken away when they get to Whitehall. Uh, so that's uh, on Saturday. It's just literally a public event on the piazza, um, but the, uh, the opportunity to photograph all four B-types together. Uh, our next meeting is one at Acton, uh, which is uh, a presentation on the uh, history of British Airways by Jim Davis, who's the BA archivist. Uh, 
a number of friends, a relatively small number because of the restrictions in everybody on the number, um, have visited the BA Heritage Centre uh, out at Heathrow, uh, and there's a, a group who couldn't be accommodated on the first visit who are awaiting a second visit. Um, the, the message from uh, the first visit that's taken place was that it was a splendid visit, very interesting, uh, and so we decided that to uh, enable the story to be told to a wider audience, uh, we would ask Jim to come to Acton uh, and give a talk. Uh, so that's on Thursday the 11th of October uh, at Acton at 2 o'clock, uh, and our next meeting here uh, is a presentation by Martin Gilbert, uh, entitled Titans, Tigers and Lions, uh, which is, of course, not a reference to wild animals, but to buses, uh, a personal journey through the world of transport. Uh, and Martin is going to talk uh, something about his total involvement with public transport. Uh, he was, of course, until very recently, and the friends visited him at Reading, uh, the chief executive officer of Reading Buses, uh, and getting some acclaim for what he was doing there, not just in running the company from the point of view of running the buses, but being very innovative with supporting technical IT and social media activities, of which I think Martin's quite, quite proud. Uh, so he will talk, I suspect, something about Reading, because it is still a very recent recollection for him, uh, but since our visit uh, in the last few months, uh, he has uh, changed his job and is now uh, the director of Go Northeast uh, in uh, Newcastle, which also embraces Sunderland and District and East Yorkshire, I think, now following yeah. the acquisition. Uh, so I think you'll get a mix of everything I've done, uh, particularly what I did in Reading and, uh, and what I'm now doing in, uh, in Go Northeast. Uh, and that meeting is in one month's time on the uh, 29th of October. And bookings for both of those visits should be open on the website as from tomorrow, all being well. One more thing. Uh, I have a calendar for the year 2019. Um, if you come and have a look at it later, you'll see on the front cover uh, there's some rather splendid... Uh, images of uh, 12 London buses through the ages. Uh, as you turn the pages of the calendar over, each of those becomes uh, one month. Uh, it's a splendid piece of design and presentation by Doug Rose, who many of you will know uh, and who's here tonight. Uh, it's now on sale. Uh, if you were to go upstairs to the shop, they would be asking openly for £12. You would claim your 10% discount and you get it for around the £11 uh, on sale tonight upstairs through Susan for around tenner. Um, and it is a splendid, a really a splendid publication. Uh, and just timely, you probably haven't bought your 2019 calendars yet. Do it now. Okay, uh, more than enough from me. Uh, I will hand over to Roger Wright, who probably needs no introduction if I were to simply say Blue Triangle, Epping Onga Railway, and London Bus Company. Uh, I would describe Roger's involvement with public transport, and I would summarise his talk, but let's hear the full, the full version. <laughs> right, well, good evening. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. I've got to grapple with technical um, paraphernalia that I'm not very good at, I'm afraid, so I've been told I've got to switch a button on. That's it. Hopefully, when I wander around and get lost on the stage... Oh, dear. I told you, didn't I? Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Good. Uh, well, welcome. Thanks very much for coming along this evening. I... Um, when the uh, museum friends asked me to do a presentation, I thought, well, what should the theme be? Clearly, it's going to be buses and trains in some sort of shape. But uh, um, I realised that I've actually been 40 years um, looking after buses and trains in the, in, in the bus industry mainly, but also the rail industry. So I thought the theme tonight would be uh, my first 40 years. Um, and it all starts really way back before my time, back in the 50s and 60s, and we see RTW 95 here at Allgate. Mum and Dad, uh, Mum and Stepdad actually, were a crew at Upson Park Garage. Um, and Mum was on the 15s years and years ago. In fact, she was carrying me when she was pregnant 
Uh, she was carrying me about on 15s. Uh, and I suppose, really, having done that, having gone to work with them during the school holidays, there was no hope for me, really. I was always going to be involved in buses at some shape or form. So um, stepdad said to me, don't you go on the buses, go and get yourself a proper job, which uh, I ended up uh, going to be working at a bank. Got me cheap mortgage at a time when mortgages were 15%, so probably it was a good move to start off with. But years later, I thought to myself, you know, I've still got it in me. I still really want to have a go at being a bus driver. So I was going to, the plan was I was going to become a driving instructor with a mate of mine. We, he had a driving school. We were going to get a second car. We were going to be the next BSM. And um, I thought, just for six months, I'll get it out of my system. I'm going to go and be a bus driver. And um, so what I did eventually, um, if I can make this work, uh, bah, 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 bah. I told you, there we are. Um, I actually joined London Transport in 1978, uh, and I was stationed to West Ham Garage. There's a very young-looking chap in the cab there who looks like somebody I used to know many, many years ago. But... Uh, that was the last night of the 69s, um, and altogether I've done nine years, nearly ten years actually, uh, at London Transport, driving RMs, and when all the RMs went from West Ham, I decided that uh, I, I didn't really want to um, drive one-man buses, so I transferred down to Bow, uh, and around about that time, um, myself and a couple of friends were thinking, you know, what about maybe trying to start our own business, trying to uh, have a go at trying to be a bus operator, so we all went to college, and I managed to pass the test, so I became the transport manager. And we launched something called Blue Triangle. Um, and there we are, back. Um, I, the snow has gone rather strange shape, or is it just the way I'm standing? But uh, that's a, a shot at Harlow bus station. So Blue Triangle started off as a school contract, and we carried on working because there wasn't enough money coming out of Blue Triangle in those early days. Um, I carried on, uh, and the three of us, there was Mick, Bob and myself, and we all worked for London Transport, being bus drivers. Um, Mick and myself self, um, uh, stayed on for a couple of years, and all of a sudden we got our first school contract, which was ever so exciting. Uh, it was £23 to take a, a couple of buses down to uh, a school playing field every afternoon of the week. Uh, two buses, so £46 a day. And we were so excited, we all went down the CAF to celebrate, the three of us, and we got there and all of our egg and chips and the cups of tea, and we had, only had about £3 between us, so we could just about afford one cup of tea uh, and an egg and chips. But that was the, uh, that was the start of Blue Triangle. Um, over the years, Blue Triangle, um, I say, well, started the three of us and decided that, well, we go up London, everywhere you look, there are blue, uh, there are sightseeing buses full of people. Let's go and get ourselves a sightseeing licence. So we applied, we managed to get ourselves a position, as it says there, in uh, Whitehall by the Cenotaph. The idea today that you'd be able to park in front of the Cenotaph and sometimes we'd wander down the toilet or go and get yourself a sandwich and, and just leave the bus there unattended. But uh, we started our sightseeing business from the Cenotaph, uh, competing with lots of other operators there at the time. Um, so that was our very first bus. We turned up on the first day, which was a bank holiday Monday. We'd given up work on the Friday. Um, we'd got the bus ready on Saturday and Sunday, and bank holiday Monday lunchtime, we managed to get up to Cenotaph, and we parked on it, we put a board out, and we thought, this is great, it's going to fill up, and nobody got on, and we thought, oh, what are we doing wrong? A friend of mine who was an inspector on London Transport, in those days there were still inspectors uniformed, he come along chatting to us, and as soon as he was started talking to us with a hat, um, people started coming on giving him a five pound note, and we thought, it's the first lesson, we need to get uniforms. So um, the sightseeing continued, um, that was our first bus. Our second one was a Plymouth Atlantean, which uh, is a real pig to drive. It had no power steering, and most of our drivers absolutely hated driving it. But uh, that was our second one, and um, initially on the first one on the RMO, we didn't have uh, any guide. We just... Um, uh, so we didn't have any speaker system, we just had a, a, a guide of myself. So um, I, I used to work seven days a week, Bob and Mick would do every other day, and I'd be the person on the microphone um, doing the spiel. When we got the Atlantean, um, I experimented, we made our own tape, and we started doing recorded uh, commentary, and, um, and so it went. So 
over the years, we, um, we ended up getting more and more, uh, mainly DMSs, and we ended up with a fleet of about eight. Uh, and we sightseeing was our main income stream during the summer. Um, around about the same time, we decided we couldn't just live on sightseeing, which was really a six-month-a-year business for us. Whitehall wasn't particularly busy in the winter. So we uh, decided to put in for some council contracts, and uh, we were fortunate enough to win Route 500. It uh, ran every evening, Monday to Friday, from about uh, 6 through to about 8 o'clock in the evening, and it also ran all day Sundays. And uh, we made a rather strange choice of rather getting reliable buses. We booked MBA 539 and SM1, which are probably the most two un most unreliable buses you could ever imagine. And um, we managed to cope, but very often if one of these broke down or wasn't working properly, we, we ended up putting all sorts of things, RTs, RFs, whatever, used to end up on the 500s, but we kept the service going. Uh, along came the chance to buy a Willowbrook Leopard, um, which you see here, Hup 131N. And all of a sudden we had something we'd never had before. It was reliable, it was warm, and it was fast. And all the drivers loved it. And you didn't want to drive an MBA or an SM anymore on a cold night. Uh, you instead had the great opportunity of uh, a nice warm bus. And um, that was our first ever contract. And it, it sort of started simultaneously with our second contract, which was um, Route 622. Um, RT2799, is it me or is that slide make it look like, like it's 18 foot high and only 10 foot long? Is, is it? It looks a bit strange for me. Maybe it's the angle I'm looking at it, but... Uh... I think if you click to right, you'll get rid of the bar at the top. Just click, use the mouse to click on the, on the X top right, and you'll lose the, the bar. Stuff. Right, OK. Um, this one here? No. <laughs> Technical, don't do it. This is the blind teaching the blind here. Yeah, come on. Oh. Is that any better? All right, OK. Um, so we, we, we thought... All our dreams had come true. We actually won a contract to run the sort of buses we wanted to run. And the reason I started Blue Triangle, um, the Blue Triangle name was, was all about um, Blue Triangle being the AEC badge. And we were, all three of us, were quite fervent AEC fans. Um, but it was also the three of us, and our first bus, as you saw earlier, the RMA was blue. So it seemed an apt name. But when we got this contract to run two RTs, we sometimes use the RCL, Right way through Essex on a Sunday, we thought all our dreams had come true. Later on in the year, the council phoned and said uh, the replacement contract in the winter um, has been, we've been let down by another operator. Could you carry on running through the winter? Um, you can use the same buses if you like. It's just called the 363. So we use the same buses. We dropped the via point down by one line to, to lose Sybil Headnam. Uh, and all of a sudden, we were running from Harlow through Brian Street to Whittam, uh, all the way through the winter, um, which was really, um, well, quite memorable. Um, in, in all weathers, with headlights just pointed down to the ground, and uh, hardly appropriate vehicles, not even in 1989. But um, that was the beginning of our contracts, really. Um, the, the contracts continued through the years, and Essex County Council decided they didn't really want a London bus. They, they, they thought um, they were ever so disappointed that we'd turned up with RTs, because I think they, what they were probably looking for is something quintessentially Essex, um, something green. Um, so they let a different contract, thinking that somebody else would put in an appropriate sin green single decker, and we won the contract again for uh, this time an RF. <laughs> Uh, and RF401 was our main vehicle on the 612, which was a massively long four-hour route, which went from Romford to Colchester via the, the whole of Essex, really. Um, it, it took four hours to get there. It went halfway back to Braintree. You had a mill break, and then you know, Colchester and back home again. Massive mileage. That RF really, really worked hard for us. Uh, and RF401, we bought it specially for that uh, contract. And that was, what, 1989, 1990? So 28 years later, 401 still out regularly every weekend doing wedding work for us. Uh, one, one of our very loyal fleet of buses um, that uh, is still running with us today. Uh, while we were running Blue Shrine, we had the opportunity to celebrate various last days, and etc., etc., things that were happening in those days. And here we see Horn Church Garage, um, the week before closure in September 1988. Um, 
we there was a charity do to raise money for um, the children's hospital, and the the, the, the plan was that uh, London Transport crews had one RT. We gave them twenty one fifty. We had RT2799, and the idea was to raise money and a bit of a competition between the two sets of crews as to who took the most money. Now, unfortunately, Hornchurch cheated in that uh, the inspectors were turning all the buses in front of 2150 away so that they had a huge gap, and they were full up all day long, and they beat us by a tenner. I think we got about £600, and they, uh, and they got about 610 or something like that. But that was uh, way back in 1988, before the very sad closure of, um, of Hornchurch Garage. Um, we were doing quite well with school contracts. We had our couple of bus routes, and we thought we'd probably have a flirt with um, the coach business. And uh, what a mistake that was. Uh, I, we very soon learned that buses and coaches are two completely different industries, uh, as are bus drivers and coach drivers. You get a few that, um, that, can, that, that can manage with both, but uh, bus drivers are bus drivers and coach drivers and coach drivers are coach drivers. We bought an RB, uh, RB130, which was a wonderful old machine, and that was our first coach. We ended up with a couple of other leopards, and we thought we had, again, visions of grandeur, thinking that uh, our, um, our, our coach business was going to prop up things during the winter, perhaps, when we didn't have work for the sightseeing buses. Uh, we then invested in a three-axle uh, metro liner, which um, really was probably it was a bit of a... It seemed a good idea at the time, uh, and the very first job we did with it, we had it all painted up, and it looked wonderful. It was lovely inside, the seats were almost like new. It had spent half its life going up and down the motorway, or all its life going up the motorway from, uh, from Cornwall twice a day, uh, one and a half times a day. So it was pretty much worn out when we got it. But we were proud of it, and the first day I took a whole load of rugby crowd out on a Beano, uh, and that was the day pretty much I decided coaches are not for me. We, we need to stay with the bus side. And so over the years, we, we stayed with the bus business pretty much all the way through Blue Triangle. Uh, and it started off very small, as I say, with a couple of school contracts with uh, a few private hires here and there. We kept a couple of coaches just as background sort of work. Um, but eventually, we started to win more contracts. Uh, and we won Route 265. Um, Essex County Council phoned us up and said, hello, Roger. Um, we're very interested in giving you a contract. Uh, what sort of buses would you use if we gave you Route 265? And the answer isn't MBA or SM. <laughs> I said, uh, how does London Nationals do? You've got the contract. Congratulations. So um, we went out and bought uh, three London Nationals. Bought two London Transport London Nationals, 174 and 300. And we bought this um, single-door uh, X London Country, which on TPD 178M, something like that, which we called uh, SN, I can't we call it, 78, we called it, LC 78 is what we called it. Um, and uh, there we see, probably a few of you know, a guy called Bruce, Bruce Swain, who's in the cab there, shivering away in his poor old um, Leyland National out in the snow near Brentwood. Uh, as well as operating buses, we ended up buying and selling buses. Uh, it, it was unintended consequence really we went and bought an RM up in the scrapyard and there were half a dozen more so we, we bought them all and brought them back and we started to, to sell buses on and a group of people come along and said we'd like to buy a bus for a contract uh, running down the seafront at uh, Newhaven so we sold them 933 uh, then they said you do really well we want another one so we bought them RM 960 uh, and then we sold them a few more and Cut a long story short, the, um, the, it took a while for them to, to pay their bills and they started to fall behind. So we went down to have a discussion with them one day uh, and we were offered the option of taking over uh, Haven Bus down in New Haven. Which, again, at the time seemed quite exciting, having two depots and, and spreading out down to the Brighton area. So we, um, we decided to have a go at running some school contracts and um, uh, some bus routes down... Uh, on, on the seafront down at uh, Bryson. Because what we didn't realise at the time, we were up against probably one of the best operators in the country with Brighton and Hove, who were, and stood off, absolutely superb. 
Um, and we were trying to battle out with old Atlanteans and DMSs and things like that. So we thought we'd invest really heavily in a fleet of Leyland Nationals, and these were probably the smartest things we ever had down at uh, New Haven. And we were competing on the uh, Eastbourne to Brighton service, um, which I think these days runs about every 10 or 15 minutes, but in those days it was a, was a half hourly service. And we were trying to run five minutes in front of Brighton and Hove, as you do. Um, but that was our, uh, our little uh, attempt at operating down at New Haven. We kept on and kept on, and after, I don't know, probably uh, 18 months, we decided that that wasn't for us, um, and we thought it was about time to, to try something else. Um, at the time, so we started off with three of us, Bob Humphreys, Mick Bedell and myself. Uh, Bob had left many years ago. Mick decided it wasn't for him to go into TFL work. He, he didn't fancy the idea of lots of new buses. Uh, I mean, one of these new buses was probably the value of our whole fleet prior to, to, to taking on the tender bus work. So... Mick left, he went off, and it was just me. So I thought, well, okay, we've got to have a go, because by this time we'd sold the sightseeing, and the sightseeing was the bit of cash that we needed to keep us going. And without the sightseeing, just the school contracts, the bus routes, a few private hires, it wasn't really enough to take us forward. And I looked at the, the possibility of, um, of, of tender bus work as being an option. So we put in for the 474s, and lo and behold, we got it, and we were... Quite delighted, we were getting ready to set up. Now, I was talking to TFL, and I said, look, TFL, we just sold the sightseeing. I've got lots of staff hanging around doing nothing. So just in case anything crops up in the meantime before we start the 474, do give us a call you know, if you need us for anything. Uh, did they give us a call? Um, all of a sudden, Route 60 all went wrong. Um, the plan was uh, Route 60 had been won by an operator in South London. And I got a message about a week before it was about to go live that A, they didn't have any buses, B, they didn't have any drivers, and C, they didn't have a yard. Um, and I've heard this from fairly, fairly solid um, uh, source that I actually believe. So I thought, I'd better ring TFL up. And I rang TFL up, and they said, um, no, 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 what are you talking about? No. Leave it, it's all okay, you haven't got to worry about it. So I said, well, okay, fair enough. That was on the Monday before the Saturday that they started. On the Wednesday, I think it was, or it might have been the Thursday, I think it's Wednesday, we got a phone call saying, um, yes, actually, we've got a bit of a problem with Route 60 in South London. Is there anything you can do? And so, in short, we took on Route 60, which was something like 21 buses. It was a huge operation. And clearly, uh, based in Croydon, Fulton Heath, Purley, um, it was a long way from our base in, uh, in Raynham. But we ended up getting as many of our own buses uh, together with our own staff to actually operate it. And then we brought in all sorts of other people to assist us with the operation. Um, that was the start of something, and even before we got the 474, we got another call from TFL saying, we've been let down again, Route 127, can you help any more? Uh, same thing applied, so we ended up taking on the 60s and the 127s uh, together, and we were running probably, we were probably responsible for about 20, no, probably about 30, 35 buses in South London, not on our terrain at all. Many of them subcontracted to other operators, but we were effectively were managing it all. Um, and that was the start, really, of, uh, I think we've done 15 different routes for TFL, not including our own full-time contracts. So apart from our 474s and other routes that we won, we were, uh, I mean, we were often called by other people, International Rescue, where we got a phone call, and uh, sometimes at very short notice, we were out there running all sorts of other routes. Um, there was, uh, well, I've got some shots of uh, one or two other shots. Uh, the only time we ever run minibuses... Um, but the C10s, something went wrong with the operator there. And again, we got a phone call saying, look, you know, can you start something in about two weeks' time? And we said, well, we haven't got any suitable buses. Um, so we made some phone calls. 
And I think we ended up with, we needed four or five of these vehicles, and we chose these Mercedes from Dawson Rentals, I think it was. And I phoned TFL up and said, look, I've got five vehicles, but they're three different colours. They're blue ones, they're red ones, and they're white ones. Is that OK? It doesn't matter. Just get the service running. So it's corporate identity. So there it is. It's a blue minibus with red, blue triangle plastered on the side. Um, route one. The... Uh, a lot of these were quite short-lived. Uh, route 1 was a, probably, I think it was a peak hour only service. We got a number of those. Um, lots of other routes, as I said. And um, we'd done the 1s, we'd done the 53s, we'd done the 61s, 2s, 7s. We helped with other operators using their own vehicles. C, C routes down in Croydon, um, the various other different routes. And one of them was the 367, which, um, again... I think the problem with that was it was a go-ahead route. Um, if, uh, it might have been the, a Riva route. I think it was an Riva route. Uh, we also had a go-ahead route, the 492. And there was nothing wrong with the operators. They were good operators, but they were really struggling with staff shortages in South London. So uh, we were in a place in a slightly better position where we were down in Raynham, and we were able to get staff that they couldn't. So again, we ended up um, alongside our... Uh, our own operations, we started to run various routes. I'll say a total of about 15. Some, like the 150s, um, was three weeks. Some, like the 185s, was um, 11 months, almost a year. So, and this was quite a useful source of income um, for us over the years. Um, as well as doing bus work, etc., etc., by now we'd given up the idea of being... Um, Coach operators, we were, we were bus people, and that's what we were doing. And rail replacement was clearly something we could do with the spare capacity that we had at weekends, uh, bank holidays and things like that. So the uh, next slide shows um, Titan IV, and what we used to do was, again, we used to take on quite a lot of the contracts, and often far more than we could operate ourselves. So we might take on a, a 60 duty uh, operation, do 30 duties ourselves on a Saturday and Sunday, and sub the rest out to op other operators. And I think at one stage we were probably one of the larger TFL uh, rail replacement operators uh, in London. I mean, I think the, um, the rail replacement became something very valuable over the years, and it, it wasn't just uh, weekend stuff. If you remember back in 2003, 4, I know um, certainly Nick, you'll remember when the Central Line had a big problem with motors falling off of, uh, of, off of, off of their um, uh, stock that the central line was suspended for something like three and a half to four months. And uh, together with Enzymes, we shared the contracts in, in the east. Uh, I think in the west, it, it didn't matter. There were lots of other tube lines. But in the east, there wasn't any alternative to get people around. So we were moving people on our rail replacement buses seven days a week for, for three months. And that was a very useful source of income. There we see, it's not just London stuff we've got. We bought a number of um, provincial vehicles. Um, now, again, I think from memory, this was a Manchester uh, Metro bus. Com c correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but we, we, um, we, we used to use these on school contracts. And as I said, weekends, they were a uh, useful in uh, income for us during rail replacement. Dome. Do we all remember the dome? Um, we were approached by TfL. Uh, we, we, we put in a tender to operate buses uh, around the dome, just in case for when the right dome opened and the Jubilee Line extension opened simultaneously, I think all the politicians were very concerned that if things went wrong, there's no way of getting people to their new, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the dome, the, the, the exhibition that was there for a year, the new train service might be disrupted. So it was very important for TfL to have some sort of contingency in the, back, in, in, uh, in the background. So we put in our tender for double decks. There were about four double decks and there was one single deck. And I, I was doing the tenders one Sunday afternoon. I got all the double deck ones in. I wasn't going to put in for single decks because we didn't, didn't have any single deckers really that were suitable. So I had a couple of hours spare and I thought, do you know what, I will just put in a tender. And I put in a tender for some single decks and we won the contract. So together with um, an operator in North London, we shared the contract, which was effectively to park up in a car park about a quarter of a mile from, from the dome and uh, wait there in case we were called. I think in a nine-month contract, 
Uh, I think we went out about 30 times, and, and most of those times we went out, we only got as far as North Greenwich Station, by which time a message had come through, the train service is now up and running. So if anybody's got pictures of dome buses at places like uh, Canning Town, I'll be quite surprised, because I've never seen one. Uh, and they very rough. Some of our drivers used to, they used to do 13-day fortnights, because, uh, and they, they were something like... 12 or 14 hour days and all they had to do was to go by train to North Greenwich, sit in a bus all day long, go down McDonald's for their break and then go home and these people were earning an absolute fortune doing 13 days fortnight but uh, you do ask them to do a, a, a rest day on a bus route, oh no no no, I work on the dome because they haven't got to do anything, they had pool tables, they had all sorts of facilities down there. Uh, and it's, again, a very useful contract. What was interesting, halfway through the contract, uh, we thought we got a phone call from TfL. We thought they're going to take the contract away because nobody's using it. And they said, look, summer's coming. Can we put some extra buses on it? So we actually uh, put extra double-deckers on the contracts as well. But uh, anyway, that lasted for almost a year uh, in the year 2000. Um, route 368. Now, I mentioned Mum earlier uh, as being clippy on, on the buses with my stepdad. As I say, there were 60 years between them. By now, uh, Dad had disappeared, but Mum still lived, as it turned out, on the 368 route. And uh, I did the first ever 368 one morning. Uh, went down to Shagwell Heath, and on the way back, Mum was standing there with uh, a round of hot toast and a mug of tea. And I said, Mum... <laughs> I was on the very first one, which is unusual for me, for people who know me doing an early term. And I pulled over there, and she just weighed me down. I said, Mum, I've got passengers on board. Going, oh, I could just have a cup of tea. It won't hurt you. <laughs> anyway, I, I dutifully uh, gulped my toast down and drunk my tea. What was interesting, Mum used to use the buses every day. She was very active, uh, and she used to ride into Barking. And she would, um, she would tell me, if the drivers were doing anything bad, this driver, he was on his phone, or this driver, he was smoking, or there's two of your buses together. Uh, you know, and she used to, I used to get phone calls all the time. She was my point inspector in <laughs> Beckentree <laughs> Avenue. Uh, good old mum. And uh, 181, which actually we're restoring at the moment. We're actually going to get it back on the road. We called that Eva after my mum, uh, and that's going to be back on the road very soon. Um, the contracts kept coming. Uh, we won Route 248, which was... Probably for the first time was actually a local contract to us because most of our contracts were all, either been going down to Docklands for the 474 or even worse, down to Purley and Croydon for some of these other routes. All of a sudden, we got a, a contract that was you know, just around the corner, 248. Uh, ran through, uh, it's quite a big route, it's 14 buses, which was quite a big contract for us. And um, yeah, so we. We have operated the 248. Um, by this time, we had the, uh, the 248s, the 368s, um, and special days, we were able to play buses for a day. Here we've got the LT Museum's RT4712 plus our own RT3871. Uh, I can't remember what the celebration was, but we had a weekend where we were permitted to run uh, some vintage buses on the 248, and here we see the two there um, down at Upminster Park Estate. Uh, around about that time, early 2000s, the route masters were starting to come off, and there were lots of last day uh, celebrations with lots of visiting route masters and sometimes RTs running on last days. And there we see RT3062 with a full load, uh, steaming away there, overheating. I think that's me driving, and upstairs on the front seat is my daughter peering down at the photographer. So, um, hello, Helen, if you're listening tonight. We carried on winning some contracts. Um, 372 was a, uh, again, a nice local. It actually went right the way through Raynham, where we were based. So our drivers could walk from the depot and take over the 372, which was wonderful. Uh, again, the first time it had happened. Uh, we also had a number of school contracts, um, and uh, they, they were TFL school contracts, and we also got an enlargement of Route 474. The, the route was extended from... Um, uh, where was it from uh, bah, 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 um, it was extended up to Manor Park and we got five extra vehicles so we thought we'd have a go at running Scanners. I think we were one of the first operators to run Scanners in London they were superb vehicles we were very very pleased with the, uh, the five that ran alongside our Tridents uh, on the 474 um, 
there's a 649. As I said, we had three or four school contracts, which probably used about half a dozen Metro buses and Titans. Uh, and they used, uh, again, they were out Monday to Fridays on school contracts and rail replacement or temporary contracts uh, other times. Finally, we, um, this is one of the last contracts we won, which was Route 362. Uh, the 362 and the 364, which we ran, uh, we also won shortly afterwards, were our last two um, routes before... We were approached uh, by a number of companies and um, who were quite interested in, in, in buying Blue Triangle. And I must admit, I was, we were doing well. We were very profitable. I enjoyed doing what we did. We had 200, 250 staff. We, we were a successful company. I was still quite young. And I thought, I don't really want to sell Blue Triangle. What am I going to do tomorrow if I, if I sell it? Anyway, the uh, go-ahead kept on and kept on and kept on. And finally... We shook hands with Go Ahead, uh, and they took over the whole caboose down at Rainham, including the depot. And uh, here we see one of their vehicles, PDL1, on the 248s, just after they're taken over. So, here I am, 2007. I've sold my pride and joy, my bus company that I've spent 20 years doing, um, building up. And I said to my daughter, what am I going to do? I'll just, you know, just go down and collect my pension at the post office. I'm going to get bored to tears. What I had already done um, a few years before, um, Mick and myself, uh, Mick was passing the old closed down on station one night, and there was a group of people outside. So Mick, being Mick, went down there and said, hello there, who are you? And they said, well, well who are you? And Mick explained that we run a bus company and da 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 Anyway... The people he met was a group called Pilot Developments, who were the preferred bidder to go and buy the Effinonga Railway. And we were invited along to become shareholders. So I thought, OK, we'll invest a little bit of money. So we, we made some... This is before I'd sold Blue Triangle. Mick and I had invested a small amount of money as minority shareholders, thinking that one day we'd be able to run our trains. Because me, me and Mick, as you do, we just bought... Um, two DMUs um, and a couple of locos, believe it or not. So, um, long story, but we bought them and we actually had them in our bus shed down at Raynham. Didn't have any railway track to run them on. So, when we met, but when we met someone who, we, who actually had a railway line who was shortlisted as being the preferred bidder for the Epinonga Railway, we thought, let's just join these people. So, we joined and around about 2004, 10 years after the line first closed, um, the Volunteer Society set up this little operation. It's a Sunday morning operation, really, just three or four trips from Onga using the blue DMU we see here. Uh, and they, they put on their own special events. That was a teddy bear's picnic, I think they had. Um, and it was all very small, low key. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, I think it's fair to say that the people at Pilot who we joined were really not particularly train enthusiasts, they were more interested in uh, trying to develop some of the surplus land as pro for property develop development on me. Uh, and um, they weren't really interested in this little DMU service that only made a few bob on a Sunday morning. So here we are, 2007. I've sold Blue Triangle. I'm sitting around. I don't, don't know what to do myself. And all of a sudden, the group that I was part of at the Epinonga Railway... Um, they sold some surplus property after 10 years at, Epping, uh, at, at Onga Station. And everybody, including me, wanted to get out. We were all fed up with the bad press we were getting uh, about the, uh, the operation, the fact that these people were sharks and, and, and speculators and one thing and the other. Anyway, at one of the meetings, we all triumphantly uh, realised that we'd sold a bit of land to a developer and what we're going to do with the rest of the land. So... Um, somebody, one of the guys, a guy called Nigel, who had a load of five foot gauge Finnish locomotives, um, he put in a bid to buy the rest of the line. Uh, he went round the table, there were five directors, and we needed unanimity. Uh, we all had to say yes before we were uh, actually let sell part of the asset. He went round the table, and it was yes, 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 yes. I was the last one to vote, and I said, no, no, you're not going to have it, not for that amount of money. So I was glad that, I wasn't very really popular because everybody just wanted to sort of run into the sunset with a bit of cash we had. And I decided that um, 
so we all went through a sealed bid um, process between the five directors, and I went up to London on this particular day where my bid had to be in, and I typed up seven or eight different bids of low to high, and I had one bit of paper that said no bid, and I sat at Oxford Circus waiting to go into our solicitor's office, thinking, I've just got rid of all this responsibility, do I really want any more hassle in my life? Yeah, I should be sitting up and taking it easy. So, cut a long story short, um, and the winner is, oh, no, 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 it's me. <laughs> so, as I tell people, I, I've got a few bob off a go ahead to sell Blue Triangle, and rather than spend it on wine, women, and song, I bought a rusty railway. And uh, I took over 100% uh, of this really run-down old railway. I bought it in December 2007, five months after I'd sold Blue Triangle. And the DME service was running... It was making no money. The track was in poor condition. The station stations were almost derelict. Uh, that's platform one at Northwood Station. Uh, you can't see from that picture, but part of the platform was falling away into the undergrowth. The signal box was boarded up. The concrete bridge you see there and the waiting room, the bridge was condemned. Uh, been condemned in uh, London transport days. Uh, the whole thing clearly had to really re needed rejuvenating. So I thought, well, if, we're gonna, if I'm going to do it, let's try it and do it properly as best we can. I wasn't happy with just running a DMU service. So the next few slides show, as it was before, really, uh, what I took over, which was to say, it was a, we used to call it, it's six miles along the line, it's six miles from Epping down to Onga. We used to call it the snake. And when we took over from London Underground, there was no points, there were no run-round loops, it was just a six-mile single track, that's all there was, and two platforms, one at Northfield, one at Onga. Um, and it was all pretty derelict. The track was in a shocking state. There were We had already done some work, and in the pilot days, we had already uh, dug underneath the uh, motorway to allow full-size trains to get underneath there. So, because uh, that bridge was the only one that was built for tube gauge because when the, the M11 was constructed there wasn't uh, nobody foresaw that there might be a requirement for full size trains to actually uh, run through there. Here we see um, one of our guys up the ladder <coughs> trying to get the volunteers hated pilot they hated the blue corporate liver livery that pilot had insisted upon and they wanted to quickly as possible get rid of all blue and put it back to something more railway, uh, more railway relevant. Uh, so we started the process of it, and it soon became evident that this was not the job for volunteers and <coughs> me up a ladder. Certainly not, because I'm not a DIY person. This was a major engineering project. Um, so we got together a team of builders. Um, we, we had one particular builder who had probably four, five, six people. Sometimes it was 10 people and sometimes it was 20 people, depending on the project we were undertaking. Heavy machinery was brought in. One of the things that had uh, happened back in London underground days uh, was they had raised the track bed at both Northfield and Onga stations so that the tube train's uh, door met the platform. That meant that our trains would sit far too high. So, shall we, shall we? Come on, while we've got it closed down, we'll do it. So we took, I think it was 10 inches, all the way through Northwood Station, all the way through Onga Station, <laughs> took 10 inches off the soil away, had to replace all the ballast. That in itself, if you can imagine the amount of debris that come out of it. But we didn't want the situation where our trains were sitting far too high in the platform. So here you see the tracks come out, um, then the balance has been scraped, we've taken 10 inches away, uh, and there you see, by now, you see that the uh, footbridge, the condemned footbridge has gone, the concrete waiting shelter, which wasn't in much better condition, has also gone, and the track, for as far as you can see in both directions, has disappeared. Uh, we had to move some trees out of the way, most of the line was completely over overgrown with... Um, uh, heavy trees, it was like a tunnel where a, a tube train had gone through with just trees and, and very little um, work had been done for probably since 1994 when London Underground shut the line. So um, we were very fortunate uh, when we took, uh, in the pilot days, uh, I say pilot were the preferred bidder 
Uh, and together with OPS, the Onga Rail Preservation Society, who had been, been around for many years, and they thought that they were going to take over um, the, the railway when London Transport finally closed it. And uh, when we joined Pilot as preferred biller, um, OPS were very cross with Pilot, uh, to say the least. In fact, uh, there were pretty much every week in the newspaper there were nasty things about what these horrible Pilot people had done now. They're going to run flying Scotsman with folding chimneys. It was all sorts of, all sorts of nonsense. And basically, John Glover at, uh, at um, uh, OPS uh, and ourselves were worse enemies. Uh, fast forward to 2007, I took it over and John instantly phoned me up and said, look, I think our argument's over because I'm sure you want to do what we wanted to do and can we all be friends? Uh, and John Glover's been fantastic and Alps have been a fantastic support to us over the years. One of the things that John Glover had done many years ago was to rescue uh, a bridge that was being taken out from uh, around South Woodford. And there's lots of pictures which I haven't got tonight showing the, the cutting up and lifting of this bridge right in a heavily populated, uh, full of houses, getting this bridge out. And John had this span and lots of other bits and steps in one of his yards, uh, covered in rust, trees overgrowing, because it had sat in his yard for about 15 years. We took it away, shot blasted it, painted it green and had it delivered, uh, ready to go in. And there we see the main span. Um, so, moving forward a little bit, the, uh, the track's been, um, track's been uh, lowered, we've got our track back in, there's new ballast and the plinths are ready for the, um, for the bridge to be uh, sighted. And there we are, uh, we've used lots and lots of cranes over the years and that's probably one of the bigger ones where we're lifting the bridge span actually onto its supports. Um, and, uh, Go back to Onga, similar scene down at Onga. Uh, as I explained earlier, we had to rip everything out. The other complication we had was when I took it over from, from, uh, from uh, Pilot, some of the Finnish steam locos came with the deal, which sounds like a good idea, but they're five foot wide and only three and a half inches wider uh, than uh, standard stock but they might as, might as well have been three and a half feet. And we're down here with shovels and jacks and all the rest of it, trying to re-gauge track and move this stuff around Onga. And several times we had them on the ground, I can tell you. But there's one of the um, uh, locos that uh, we inherited as part of the deal. Uh, in fact, there's still one of them down at, uh, uh, at Onga. If anybody's interested in buying a nice five-foot uh, loco, come see me afterwards. So, um, again, that's... Um, <coughs> Onga, the signal box that was once on the end of the platform, had been taken out many years ago in London transport days. Uh, and we were desperately trying to find a, a, a signal box to, uh, to replace it. We almost got hold of the one at Hartford East, which was available, redundant, but we couldn't secure terms with uh, Network <coughs> Rail. They, they were unhappy, even during a possession, of the thing being lifted close to overhead wires, even though the, the, the power was off, the risk of you know, something slipping, a mistake happening. So basically, I think half of these signal boxes probably still there to this day. But fortunately, we discovered that somebody had already rescued Spellbrook, um, signal box from the um, up near Bishop Stortford Way somewhere, if you know that area. And this was sitting down at Mangaps Farm, and I think the guys at Mangaps wanted it out of the way, so we thought ideal. So we uh, we we shook hands, stuck it on the back of a lorry as you do, uh, and blocked up the whole of uh, the roads down from Mangaps Farm down to uh, uh, to Wolzonga. And there we are. You see the signal box being lifted. Um, and Spillbrook name has been taken off and Onga's already um, been fastened uh, and the whole thing was put on a plinth that we built uh, and uh, away we went. John Glover, I mentioned earlier from Alps, John had the foresight many years ago when the original Onga box was taken out, he had the foresight of grabbing the original signal frame many, many years ago. We're talking 1970s, 80s, long time ago. Uh, and John... Again, it was covered in weeds in his back garden, but he said, would you like it? And uh, many thanks to John for making that happen. That has now been reunited with the, uh, the box at Onga uh, and is now part of our uh, signaling system. 
while we had the crane in, we thought we might as well make use of it. Uh, and this Ruston loco uh, had to be lifted over those power cables onto a plinth where it still sits today uh, to advertise that there is a railway there in the hope that people will see it and come and visit us. Um, so, there we are. Um, as we're back to North World now, uh, there's me looking ever so worried, uh, but things are starting to take shape. Tarmac's going down, um, things are going back in, the signal box has been painted, um, we've now got two complete platforms, but you can see a, a flurry of activity there. Lots and lots of people um, uh, working desperately to try and hit our target. Now, our target, our tar this all started in 2008, and I thought, yeah, Easter 2010 would be open. Easter 2010 came and went. Easter 2011, I thought. We do Easter 2011, so Easter 2011, we missed that as well. So I thought, whatever, I, I, we're definitely going to make Easter 2012. We didn't even make that, but we set ourselves a date of the 26th of May 2012. And this was probably not long before then. This was probably six months beforehand, and we still had platform extensions going in. Uh, what we thought we'd do is, while we've got everything ripped out, rather than do it piecemeal, we need a longer platform on platform one. Let's build it while the track's out. Let's get it done now. Let's get the signaling system in. Let's get the signal box working. Let's get the lights in. Let's get everything so it looks like a railway again. And that was probably a four or five year project. Um, and I didn't think it was ever going to happen. But finally, here we are. 26 of May 2012, the moment of triumph where, after all those years, we managed to get the railway open and steam back on the line for the first time since uh, 1957. So, what's that, 57, 55 years? And uh, we managed to get hold of, uh, I thought, well, if we're going to open it, let's try and open it with a British Rail loco. And I, I happened to find that there were two locos to sell. One of them was Pitchford Hall. We still had three or four years ticket, uh, boiler ticket left on it. So we, uh, we bought it, we, we hid it so that nobody knew about it, and we only announced it a month or two before the opening of the line. So we thought our big debut day would be um, uh, with a full-size tender loco. The bridge is in, the platform extensions are done, we've got a signal system, and I didn't think that day was ever going to come at times, as you can imagine. And here's me just taking the opportunity of being a little bit triumphant um, on, the, uh, on the edge of uh, Pitchford Hall, um, celebrating that fantastic day. So that was, uh, say, back in 2012. Um, so we come on to the story of the Epinonga proper. Um, with, uh, like most railways, anything that makes money, um, we try to do it. So we're open most weekends. We're open 100 days a year, roughly every weekend. We're open uh, bank holidays. We open school holidays. Plus, on top of that, we do extra work. We do film work. We do centre specials. Um, and we do all sorts of stuff. Um, and we were absolutely delighted at the end of 2012 to receive not one but three awards for our railway, including Heritage Railway uh, of the Year Award from Ian Allen. And... Um, that is a very proud moment where we see, I think, Simon Jenkins presenting uh, us the award for the, um, for the uh, Heritage Railway of the, of the Year, which was, we went there not thinking we were even going to be mentioned, and to actually win that was a very proud moment, and yeah, quite a surprise, actually, and uh, I certainly had no speech ready, but um, there we are. Uh, there's, um, so Epinolga Railway, we, uh, as well as steam locos, we've got some diesels, uh, we've got a Class 37, there we see, um, I always liked 37s and, and couldn't get a Deltic, which were really my passion. Um, <laughs> but 37, I thought they looked like Deltics. When I was young, I always used to think they looked, looked a bit like Deltic. So the first loco we got, uh, we went after another one. We went after um, 6775, I think, I can't remember, 37075 or 077. Uh, we lost it at tender, it went to a scrap man in the end. And then Harry Needle was selling number 29. Nice local engine, Stratford Loco, one that I'd seen loads and loads of times going through uh, on the main line through uh, Chagwell Heath, near where I used to live. So when that came up for sale, I said, yes, we'll definitely have that one. And that was the first of our locos. We then bought um, 
a 31, which came with no paint left on it, uh, but was in superb condition. The guy we bought it from at the uh, Mid Norfolk, he said, I'm not a painter, I'm an engineer. And in terms of its reliability and its uh, uh, mechanical uh, condition, absolutely superb, but it was almost bald when we bought it. And we put it back in service, threw a tin of paint over it, uh, and there we are. Um, so, that's the 31. I mentioned the two uh, BR Locos. We uh, saw Pitchford Hall. That's uh, Prairie Class 4141, which I bought without a ticket, and that was put back in service Christmas 2012. And here you see it on that first um, uh, Christmas 2012 on our Santa Specials. So that went in service for its 10-year uh, service. Um, right, what have we got next? My love of my life, my first loco. Uh, we bought little Isabel, a little 060 uh, loco, which um, is still my favourite, even though we got Pitchford Hall and the uh, uh, and, and the Prairie. But Isabel uh, again came up for its ten year ticket, and the guys at North World, uh, I've got the knowledge now, they were able to retube it and give it a full ten year overhaul without sending it away. Whereas the big stuff like Pitchford Hall is currently away with a contractor. Uh, being done up. Um, we have all sorts of visiting locos and themed events and running all sorts of stuff that you never would have seen on the Epping Onger line where there was just little tank engines running a shuffle between Epping and, uh, and North Will. But um, here you see a 9F, which uh, I'm, I'm not a steam expert, but I think you probably all know, those of you are into steam locos were the last um, uh, locos built for British Rail, had a very short life on British Railways, but that brought huge crowds, had a huge following when it came to us. Uh, and there we are. I couldn't get my own Deltic, so we borrowed one. Um, and there is um, 55019 at Blake Hall Station. And uh, I was very proud to have a drive of that. And um, yes, it was a quite an impressive machine. Um, so we've got, uh, we have all sorts of, as I say, we have, uh, that's our Halloween um, special. <laughs> if you notice, it's a deliberate mistake. North World has become North Weird. And uh, we have ghosts and all sorts of things, people jumping on board trains as they go, go through and try to scare all the, uh, try to scare all the passengers on board. So um, lots of different events, lots of visiting locos. Um, the difficulty is, because we haven't got a connected uh, rail to another main line, uh, we're connected to the underground, but we can't bring any main full size locos in. We can only bring in uh, tube size stock. So unfortunately, everything has to come in by a lorry. So we can't have the big galas with six visiting diesels because there's six lots, lots of transport costs in, six lots of transport costs out. So we have to be quite um, uh, choosy with what we do. So probably. Um, yeah, so, as you probably know, um, around about 1970s or 80s, London Underground re-measured uh, all of their underground system. And the whole system, right to this day, is measured from um, <coughs> Onga Station, even though it's, still closed, it's now a closed-down part of the underground. And uh, here we see uh, us presenting one of the um, uh, zero, 00 markers, which had all been uh, lost when the line closed, uh, we had replicas made, and here we are um, pre presenting it to Mike Brown, the managing director of London Underground at the time, um, to celebrate uh, the fact that uh, it is still recognised. So if you see your markers on any line in London, all measured from Onga Station right down to this day. Um, events. Um, we decided to do something called End of the Tube, which was 20 years anniversary since the line closed. So in 2014, we persuaded um, London Underground to um, allow the Craven stop to come all the way from West Russia through London overnight, and you hear you see it going through Lawson on its way to Epping Onga. And we had probably one of the most successful weekends of the year running. Don't look at the yellow things on the back. It's really running on electric, OK? <laughs> <laughs> 
obviously very apt because it was the, the last uh, stop that was used on the very last line back, um, on the very last uh, train back in 1994. And we managed to get it back there for a weekend and we had four Shoma Locos, which were um, diesel operators. So we hid them down the back. And if you were careful, you get a picture of this train coming unassisted through the countryside. Um, and then we see it down a night time shop down at Onga Station. Um, we use the um, uh, event of the, uh, the 20 year closure, the uh, end of tube event. We use that to relaunch uh, one of my babies. Um, I've, I've bought a number of buses over the years, as you probably will know. Uh, RTs are my passion, but I've always wanted to get hold of RMC4. And I've tried several times and I was unsuccessful. And in 2007, again, I was able to get hold of it. And with the help of the chap who put the front end, the original front end, back on RML3, uh, Andy Baxter, we managed to get the front end uh, reconfigured. And there we see that was the launch of CRL4 uh, in September 2014. And here we see for the first time ever, I don't think ever... Uh, the four prototypes had been seen together with their, in the case of two, three, and four, with their original front ends on. There are lots of shots in the 80s where they had RMs, ones at eight, one thing and the other. Um, and I think there are several times where that happened, but this is the first time two, three, and four were seen together with their original front ends back on them. Um, right. So the fleet continues to grow. Um, the railway's up and running, we operate buses every weekend, but I'm still buying buses, I'm still trying to get missing parts like the CRL that I've never had before. And all of a sudden, I got a message that there was a whole load of buses over in Canada that were in pretty much original condition in a place called Abergwaite, Prince Edward Island. Uh, a guy called Lionel Moss, who some of you might have heard from, is a, a well-known engineer in London transport. Uh, been there for years, and he has spent 31 years going over every year to Prince Edward Island to service these buses um, and to, to keep them in tip-top condition. Uh, he said, look, Shirley Murphy, um, her husband died 30 years ago, she's in her 80s, she wants to get rid of the buses, she wants them off the island, she doesn't want grey lines to, to wreck them, she doesn't want um, uh, them to end up as advertising, haulings, etc, etc. So, um, Shirley said to him, is there anybody who would be prepared to take them off the island. And uh, Lionel's words were, well, is anyone bloke stupid enough? There's a bloke called Roger Wright. <laughs> so <laughs> off we went. The last thing I needed was 11 RT types, or uh, RT and RM types. But I went over there, we shook hands with Mrs Murphy, uh, and these buses were amazing. Some have been there for 46 years, 46 seasons, and they were in remarkable condition. Not perfect, but... They, they couldn't be left there. I felt I had a duty to do so with them. I couldn't leave them there. So we shook hands on the deal, and there we are, just before we drive them over to Halifax. Um, there they are, lined up outside Mrs. Murphy's depot for the last time. Um, two RTLs, seven RTs, and two RMs. And what we had to do, we had to drive them through three states to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And there we see on the line of route, there's RTL 1105. Um, we've... Um, thanks to John Lidston, who took something like 6,000 photographs, so he came with us, and he was hanging off the back of RTL 1076 filming, and I think it's a cracking shot there of one of the Canadian trucks overtaking us. Uh, three weeks later, this is Liverpool. They've all arrived, and there we are, um, all lined up for a picture shot uh, at the docks at Liverpool before we set off. <laughs> down. There's the old thing, you wait ages and the 11 come. <laughs> Now, I, I've lots of people to give credits to tonight for the photos because none of these pictures are mine. That was actually a Sun newspaper reporter. And we stopped at, we were going up to services, the first services, to make sure everything was running okay when we got there. And this guy came running over and started taking pictures. And we got his card and everything. And the next day, we were in the Sun, we were in the Times or the Financial Times, I think we were in three main newspapers. And this shot featured you know, quite heavily. Uh, which again is a great shot which uh, the sun very kindly allowed me to use so that was um, buying more buses that I don't need um, 
There we are. The RTO was on the 1076. Uh, Mrs. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, and Mrs. Murphy bought it for a dollar. It was taken over there in 1964 for the uh, celebration of the Confederation. It um, ran 46 years. They bought it off them for a dollar, off of the government for a dollar. They paint strips it. They put it in a hangar. They kept it there, apparently free of charge. And they started the sightseeing business. They bought a second RTL, seven RTs, two RMs, and they really serviced the uh, cruise ships. Uh, cruise ships were coming, and I've, there's pictures I've seen that Shirley's got. All 11 buses, hundreds and hundreds of people round by the docks, all getting on uh, these buses. So we, we thought we must get 1076 done first. It was her first, and we made it our first. So there we are, back... Um, now, 1076 is one of a number of vehicles that we use on our Epinonga services. Um, there you see our bus stop down at North Weald. Uh, thanks very much, Mike, for those wonderful e-plates that you've put together for us. And um, the service runs, I uh, say, 100, 110 days a year. And I think it's probably, apart from a few um, rather <coughs> altered RTs over in California... Um, I think we're the only place still running RTs on a regular basis. It's a regular bus service, so you can pay your two quid and just take a single fare. Um, and we're actually, uh, I say, we, we run 100 times a year, and the local residents love us because, um, apart from the, the fact that they have to rely on trusty bus, at times the services are out in longer, there's only half hourly, hourly services. So, us running at weekends is quite warmly welcomed by some of the, uh, some of the residents. That's a typical scene down at uh, North World Station. Uh, on a typical day, we run probably three buses on the 339s, and in the summer, we also run a uh, 381 service, which is a little country service around the lanes. There's RT 1700 uh, arriving at North World. And there we are. Route 381 is just an excuse to do it, really. Um, it starts <laughs> at North World. We've got some RFs. It goes through a really pretty route, and... Um, if you come along to the railway, you can buy a ticket, run on the tr ride on the trains all day, ride on the buses all day. If you don't want the trains, you can buy a Rover ticket for six quid, buy it off the, off the uh, uh, that's my advert done for the night. But do come along and see us. We have different vehicles every weekend. Uh, and on occasions, if the weather is not kind to us, we even have things like Daisy uh, out uh, on, on the 381s. Um, it's not always nice weather. Um, last Christmas, we were just starting at 8 o'clock to do our Santa specials. We had five buses booked to pick the people up and take them down to North Weald. And this happened. At quarter to eight, there was no snow. By quarter past eight, and that's taken half past eight, something like that, we already had a huge uh, falling of snow. Uh, myself, uh, I went out in an RT, and Keith went out, uh, Keith is here tonight, he went out in Titan 1. I went down to Epping Station, and when I got to Epping Station, I realised that we get an RT down there, but we're not going to take the Titan down there. So I went down there, picked the crowd up, told phone Keith, told him to make sure he waited at the top. Um, there's the run out that day uh, of the five buses. And there we are. Keith made himself usual. Rather than risking taking a Titan sideways down the hill at Epping Station, he, armed with his camera, he went out in the middle of the forest, and here we see that wonderful scene. Not a car in sight, but that bus was in service. We were there picking up people. We were on our way to pick up another busload of people, and RTs keep going, which uh, anybody who knows me, I'm, uh, I'm a fervent um, supporter of RTs. They're the best things we've ever run, and... Um, yeah, such, but they don't break down very often. We run the London Bus Company. Uh, we started another little arm of that called London Vintage Bus Hire Limited. And uh, along with lots of other operators uh, in, the, in or around the London area, we do the wedding work. Um, it's never going to be a great business. Uh, everybody wants your bus at one o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, and there's a limited amount of work for this type of vehicle during the week. But we've got a fleet of um, around about eight or nine route masters, backed up by RFs, the RTs, and here we see on one of our corporate dues, there's a lineup of, I don't know, seven or eight, nine vehicles there uh, on their way to a private hire in the Dockins area. Occasionally, we get called in to do all sorts of other things. When there's a strike, as there's booked to be this week, if it hasn't been cancelled, uh, we tend to get a phone call from Enzymes who need all sorts of help to provide additional buses. Uh, we tend to get Route 29, and there we are, which is one of my favourite shots in the whole world. Again, thank you, Keith. That is 
one of my favourite slides. And Keith just jumped off another bus, ran across the road, saw these two RTs, clicked. And it was a moment in time with two loaded RTs at Tottenham Court, Warren Street Station. Uh, and as Keith said, two seconds earlier, there was 50 cyclists there. You could have got the picture. But uh, there we are on the 29s. Um, as you will see, if you're out in the Holloway Road area this week, and this strike's cancelled. Sorry, have, have I? Oh. Um, unless the strike's cancelled, we're out at Holloway, and you'll probably see a similar scene there during the day, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And there we are during our layover, lunchtime. Uh, and that was a bit of a chart shot. It wasn't set up. It actually was. The, the green one was just going into the position, and the red one was just going off into service. And we got this amazing shot, which, I say, wasn't set up. It just happened. Um, and a more conventional shot, RM298 on the 29s. Full set of blinds. We do try and make the buses look as nice as we possibly can with traditional looking blinds. Um, what's great about the 29s is you're full up pretty much all the way through the peak here. You, you leave Turnpike Lane in the morning by the second stop. There might be four buses together and you're completely full. So it's the closest to proper bus work that you're ever going to see with RTs, RTWs, etc. Um, not just the 29s, when Docklands are on strike we tend to do some other, other routes and here we see RT 1790 on the 277s which has happened two or three times now um, and even RF on the 108s which uh, they were short of RFs and uh, the Jubilee line was, uh, you know, the 108s were struggling with no Jubilee line on one of these strikes, I think well, it might have been Docklands, I can't remember which. Uh, and we were asked to put um, uh, extra buses, and I think on that day we just had two RFs available, um, whereas next time it happened, we had far more modern buses. <laughs> uh, you, know what, you know what I said about buses not being very reliable? Well, here we are at 6.20 in the morning uh, at North Greenwich Station, and we see the famous 500 route from years ago, uh, now on the 108. It's SM1, MBA 539, together with a, a new imposter, um, GLS 490. And we were, were sent out to do the 108s, and we got there, and it got cancelled at half past six. So uh, we didn't actually get very far. So um, we do running days, uh, as do lots of, lots of Cobham in particular organise some running days in London, and we've uh, attended quite a few of those. Route 11 was quite a notable one. It rained all morning, uh, but in the evening we had some great opportunities to get some beautiful shots. Um, that's obviously by the Royal Exchange Bank of England area in the evening with uh, RT3062, no steam this time, uh, and RTL 1076. Again, I think this is a celebration of um, the 10 years since the last... Uh, day of the 159s and I think there was a 159 running day and we managed to get uh, our Leyland engine uh, 1993 which is, if anybody's heard it, it's a very very loud roaring Leyland engine Nice, we got the illuminated advert working and that was his first day out back on the 159s um, Last year we, um, we had the opportunity, we'd just finished MBA 539. It, it, we ran it years and years ago. It got sold off uh, 25 years by Mick. It was Mick's bus. He sold it. 25 years, it laid derelict and it, nothing much happened to it. And I bought it back about two, two three years ago and we managed to get it in, in service, got a uh, ticket on it, an MOT on it, and uh, ready for this celebration um, of routes 500 and 507. Uh, just before Leon um, uh, uh, left the, the, the position uh, last year as uh, head of surface transport, I think the plan was that he was going to have his 1444 there as well in the event it didn't happen. But we had 539 and the GLS was also in regular service that day on the 507s. Um, most recently, uh, we, we do bus events and now become quite a staple diet of what we do at uh, Epinonga. And the most recent one was... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, where we did what I called reshaping and beyond, which was really celebrating 50 years since the infamous uh, reshaping plan, September 1968. And the idea was to try and get as many MBs and SMs together 
uh, on the field, which we see there's a line of nine, um, which is, I think there's only six MBs and probably just a few more SMs coming back from Malta. But trying to get nine or ten together was quite difficult, and we managed to get nine uh, together with some visiting vehicles, including 1254 that you see there. Um, the reason it was aim beyond, I couldn't get enough MBs and SMs to run a regular service. So we were able to run SM1 and MBO 539 in service, but we also used some other vehicles, and we took the opportunity to launch our latest um, um, uh, overhaul, uh, which is SMA8. We put, uh, we bought it 28 years ago. We kept it in the yard for a few weeks, and we stuck it in a barn 28 years ago. Um, and six weeks before reshaping, about seven weeks before reshaping, we thought, shall we? Should we have a go at this? I spoke to my workshop. Uh, and this is where having a workshop of your own, London Bus and Truck, which I'll tell you a bit about in a moment, uh, meant that we were able to turn something that was in a really shocking state. That's how we got it out of the barn uh, in, the, um, in July, I think. And by September, six and a half weeks later, um, we were able to get it back in service. And there you see it, entering service that day for the first time, overtaking an RP, our RP21, which had also just been repainted. So a little bit of a, a plug for London Bus and Truck Limited, which is um, pretty much what I've got left now. I've got the railway. Uh, the railway is up and running, uh, and more on that in just a moment. But uh, we've got London Bus Company. We do a few weddings. We do extra days on the 29s. Uh, and obviously, we operate the uh, services at Epping Ongar Railway. Um, but we also have the office, uh, we also have London Bus and Truck Limited, which is our base over at Norfleet, where we do outside work for other operators, uh, and as well as do our own repaints and refurbishments. And um, I think it's a credit to the guys there what they did in just under seven weeks. So we're nearing the end, and this really is the end. That's the end of our line. Uh, the, we bought six miles. And just in the distance there, you can't see it, will be the parapet walls of the uh, Station Road Bridge at Epping. Um, six miles from Onga, and that's all the Epping Onga can ever be. We're never going to extend it to Chelmsford. We're not going to extend it anywhere. It's going to be six miles long. However, there is a possibility we would like to get a bit closer. Here we are on Platform 2 at Epping Station, looking towards our line, which carries on down the right-hand lane, as you see. So that last picture was taken 400 metres just around that bend. What we're hoping, uh, we're negotiating with London Underground to see whether we can get our current boundary a little bit closer to Epping Station, in the hope that one day we will be able to have a point-to-point crossover, an extra platform where you can arrive by tube uh, at Epping Station, and who knows, you might even be able to walk to Platform 3 and get your steam train to Ongar and North Wheel. That's all pie in the sky, that's all for the future. Um, that's pretty much what I've got for the evening, but if you, if the friends liked what I've done and would like to invite me back in another 40 years, I would uh, <laughs> be very happy to update you on progress. It Thank you very under, much. It will be under a new chairman, I think. <laughs> so I just... <clears throat> Right, sorry, just getting the roving mic to uh, uh, roving mic man. Thank you, Roger. That was excellent. Um, we have got some time for questions, uh, but if you would wait, wait for the mic, that will be appreciated because the a people listening in far flung places will hear your question, uh, and those uh, behind you will hear your question, which they won't do without the mic. Right, who's got a question? Be it bus, train, or whatever. That's handy, Roger, right next to the mic. Well done. <laughs> thanks for a fascinating talk. You, you were dis discussing how you got into um, London tendered bus work. Was there any reluctance on the part of, of LRT or LT at that time to award contracts to a, a relatively small and perhaps less known operator? Or did, yeah, did you experience any prejudice no, against the small operator or reluctance? I or were think in the early to... days there was a nervousness um, to, to a wall to a small contractor because it's quite a big thing running you know, 5, 10, 15 buses seven days a week, 364 uh, days a year 
And I think the probably the experience of the Route 60, which happened after I'd won the 474, probably did little to, to make the CFL uh, more confident about it. But I think they probably had a duty, I would suspect, to offer it out so that they didn't end up with a cartel of half a dozen operators. So I, I got the impression that they were very keen, they were very nervous about us, and they watched us like with a fine tooth comb when we first started. And um, within a few weeks, we were, uh, we were very proud, without blowing our trumpet, we were end up being the top of their league tables in terms of performance. And we pretty much stayed there all the way through the 10 years. There were two league tables for big operators and small operators. And at the time, we were pretty close to the top in terms of performance. And we were very proud of that. Uh, and we had a great team of people, which we built over the years. But yes, there was the initial nervousness that can the small people actually do what we want them to do. You proved them right, so Look, well, proved that you could. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Have I got a way light? <laughs> you may have done. <laughs> well, while, while they're thinking, Roger, um, what's the profile of the people who come to Epping Onga? It's obviously got a high profile locally. It's got a high profile with the enthusiast. How well do you feel you sort of tap into the to the general? tourist market particularly because you're you're sort of almost in London but not quite it's quite a way to go out if you're sort of yeah you're right Barry visiting. it's um, it, it's a bit of a dilemma um, we do surveys on the people who come to visit us and most of the people are probably within 10-15 miles of, uh, of, of Honga uh, so the London market's a difficult one and I think a lot of people would be put off by the uh, prospect of getting on a tube train uh, getting down to Epping, waiting for a bus, which in their mind might not come, being transported down, they've got kids, they've got pushchairs, it's all very difficult. Clearly, if we ended up with something like this, I think we could market that much better, as you can get on your tube at Oxford Circus or Bank, uh, and 35 minutes later, you're at Epping, there's a steam train waiting for you. So that clearly would be a great advantage if we can achieve that in the future. Um, but as I think you sort of refer to, the, our, our target market really is families. It's not, it's not enthusiasts. Um, and also corporate hospitality, things like that. We haven't got much in the way of facilities at either of our stations. They're both small stations. Uh, it wasn't meant to be a, a passenger, huge passenger hub in 1865. So we are looking to put up a new building down at Onga, uh, a little glass and steel structure based on the uh, old Whitechapel uh, booking hall, which was donated to us. So we're going to, subject to planning permission, put a building up at Onga, which will be somewhere where we can host events of 50, 60, 70 people uh, without them standing in a turning circle in the rain. So um, we're never going to be a bluebell. We're never going to be a, a, um, a, one of the big railways. But I think we can probably hold our own Certainly, we've run a few decent events, uh, and as you say, we've got the great gift of being the closest heritage line to London. <coughs> okay, anybody else now thought of a question? Right, right at the very front, near to this microphone. How splendid. Right. Okay, thank you. I was interested in the um, Croydon area operation, being a South Londoner, and um, did you actually, for garaging point of view, use existing LT garages? For no, your vehicles. We, we actually operated on the ones that were our own vehicles. We operated dead runs to and from Raynham every day, mm -hmm. so that had to be factored in. It wasn't too bad at five o'clock in the morning uh, or one o'clock in the morning at the end of the day, but the crew changeovers at lunchtime or whatever took a long time around the M25, all the sort of problems, so drivers finishing late. Um, but what it meant was instead of doing seven hours typical on Route 60, you've probably done five, five and a half hours on Route 60 and had elongated travelling time uh, and longer days generally, so 10 hour days instead of eight hour days. But all of our stuff was all operated, even when we used other people's vehicles, as you saw with the 367, uh, the 492, they were all garaged down at Raynham, uh, and our crews came to work at Raynham, uh, drove their bus, or got a ferry vehicle over to, to start work, and then brought the vehicles back in the evening. Was it lucrative, lucrative enough to cover that? Uh, sorry? You know? Was it lucrative, those contracts? Yeah, well, we were fortunate. We were, it was not quite name our price, but I think TFL recognised that there would be an additional cost 
in not having a garage on the route. Yeah. Um, and we need all sorts of breakdown cover arrangements in, in the area. Um, and we had an engineer based uh, in that area when we were running civil service. We had an engineer over there to assist in any breakdowns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, that was factored in to the price. So we got almost like an emergency rate, uh, particularly when it was three weeks long, it was an emergency rate. When it went on for 11 months, TfL were very keen to try and cut that down a bit, but we, we insisted that we had to have a, a decent return for the risks involved of, of having twice as many staff as perhaps the local operator would have needed to run the same number of buses. Yeah. Thank you. Right, one in the middle there. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Roger, you've clearly had a lot of experience of running companies, and obviously you have staffing companies. Now you've got a preserve railway where you have volunteers. Would you like to compare and contrast that? Because certainly Heritage <laughs> Railways seem to be, apart from one exception, I think, run using volunteer labour, and that must have different challenges to having your own staff. That's a very good point. Um, a lot, lot of people do ask me that question. We have five staff and 250 working volunteers. So that pretty much indicates what you suggest, that uh, most railways run on largely volunteer support. I think we're probably in the extreme. We've only got five staff because pretty much that's all we can afford at this time. Um, but we've got about 600 members, 700 members of the society, of which, as I say, 250 are regular volunteers. I've been to volunteer organisations uh, in the past where I've found a bit clicky, a bit unpleasant, a bit unfriendly, uh, and I have to say there's none of that at Epinongo. I've never sensed it. Um, one of the TripAdvisor comments we get the most is what a friendly bunch of people they are. We've, got, we've had a great day there. Everybody is so helpful. And that makes me very proud. I, I think we've got a fantastic team of volunteers, and I'm not just saying that for the benefit of this, this audience. Uh, people will hear me say it all the time. They are a wonderful group of people who have become our friends um, and people that I would never have met uh, outside doing what we're doing. It's, it's an unexpected consequence, actually, because when, when, I, when I bought the rusted railway, as I described earlier, I, I didn't think of it as making a whole load of new friends, but there's probably half a dozen, ten of them in the audience tonight that I would never have met who are now established friends of the railway and friends of mine. So we have social occasions. Um, I think it's true. You can ask somebody who works for you. You can say to them, yeah, please go and do that, and they don't do it. You can, you can push them a bit harder. But generally speaking... If you, um, if you recognise the limitations of a particular volunteer, if he only wants to work one day a week, don't try and make him do two, because he won't do it. Except he's doing one day, he'll do it very well, and he'll come back again. So I think as long as you don't expect more than they want to give. Uh, in our case, we've got a fantastic team, and if anybody wants to get involved in the railway, you haven't got to be there five days a week. You can come and join. It's 20 quid to join the Volunteer Society. You get four newsletters a year. And if you want to come twice a week, great. If you want to come once a year, great. You can paint fences, you can wave a flag. There's all sorts of opportunities. Uh, but most, most of our people we do it because it's good company. They like being there. It's a great social, social uh, environment. And that must, I suspect, right, that's a very high proportion of working volunteers out of the total. And that's it is, quite, yeah. That's people tell us that. And uh, yeah. we've, I think we're very lucky, maybe because, certainly, we were, we're still, I think it's 212 Heritage Railways, the OR tell us, and we're number 212, or we're, we're one of the last ones. We're certainly one of the newest ones. So I think when we first opened, rush of excitement, new railway on the edge of London, great population to, to choose from. And I think some of that paid off for us in that we got lots of people who couldn't really get to other heritage railways that were too far away, perhaps going through the tunnel down to the Bluebell. Uh, all of a sudden, we had a, a ready team of volunteers. So I think that's helped us. And the fact we're still new, we're still building, we're still promising that maybe one day we'll have Epping. Um, so we're trying to sort of paint a picture of, of better, better in the future. OK, one last question or not? Yes, one last question in the middle. Right, I was hesitating to ask this question. It sounds a bit daft. Many years ago, there was a news item on ITV that they found scorpions at Onga Station. I don't know if anybody remembers, but was there any truth in it? I went down there and I spoke to somebody. He said, well, I've never actually seen any. But have you ever 
heard anything about this. Can you verify it, or is it stuff of <laughs> craziness? <laughs> yes. Um, well, yes, a great bit of folklore long before my time. Um, I've heard all sorts of rumours. One that, yes, there were scorpions and they removed them. Uh, and the other one that uh, there was a big concern from the staff that uh, Ongo was going to be closed, they were going to lose their jobs, and a bit of publicity might do some good. But um, <laughs> I can honestly say if you come down and see us, there are no scorpions to get in your way today. <laughs> And nor, I suspect, were there ever. I think the latter, the latter explanation, I think, is generally accepted these days. Right. Thank you, Roger, very much. I have to say three things in closing. Um, the first, going back to the calendars, I thought I had said, though it's been suggested I may not have said terribly clearly, that the calendars are £12 if you buy them in the museum shop, would be £11 if you use your shop, your, your friend's discount in the shop, uh, but tonight we're not asking 12, we're not asking 11, we're asking 10. So uh, if that wasn't clear, apologies. Uh, the price uh, for cash upstairs with Susan uh, is, uh, is, is £10. Um, the second is a bit of sad news, really. Um, those of you who come here regularly, as many of you do, will know that it has been long a tradition, going certainly way back before my chairmanship of the Friends, uh, to have uh, some drinks and nibbles outside after the meeting. Um, all of that, I have to say, which has been organised by other members of the, Friends, uh, of the Friends team, really has depended on us being here, because we had to have the stuff collected and organised before we set it all out. Uh, and more importantly, uh, after you'd all departed, uh, we had to pack it all up and, uh, and, and take it back to the office. Well, the trouble now is back to the office means back to Broadway. Uh, and we haven't thought of a way uh, of making those logistics work. So apologies, there will not be wine and nibbles this evening. Uh, you can mingle outside for a while and still chat, um, but you'll have to do it in a dry and sober uh, <laughs> condition, um, I'm afraid. Uh, but third, and above all else, our thanks to Roger for an absolutely splendid presentation. It's good when they clap before I've quite finished what I was going to say because you'll get, you'll get another round in a moment. Um, I was merely going to remark that I think it's a fairly lucky man who can look back on his life and say, well, I really made quite a success of that one thing. Um, for someone who, at the moment, who knows what the future holds, can look back and say, well, I've really made quite a success of those three things, um, Blue Triangle, Epingonga, and London Bus Company and its associates, uh, that seems to me to be a remarkable personal achievement. So I think we should recognise that. Uh, and on that note, I do ask you now, because I have finished, to <laughs> give him another round of applause. <laughs> well, right, ladies and gentlemen, so you can, you can mingle a bit outside, but uh, it'll just be chat this evening. Um, sometime uh, you won't be in a hurry because the next one is basically all now set. Hmm.